Welcome to Founderline, the show where we answer your questions about startups. I'm your host, Joe Beninato. Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us today. Our goal with Founderline is to provide a forum where people who are interested in startups can get their questions answered. So you might be a startup founder who's thinking about uh, starting a company. You might be someone who's already started a company and encountering a situation uh, that you need some help with. Um, you might be thinking about joining a company and want to get some advice about how to evaluate the opportunity. Whatever uh, your situation is, we're here to help. Uh, this is a live show, and so in order for this to work, we need you to participate. So you can do that multiple ways. Um, you can call us. The number is toll-free, 1-844-4-FOUNDER, and that's 1-844-436-8633. You can email us. The email address is help at founderline.com. And you can also tweet questions to us. The Twitter handle is at founderline. With that, let's get started. Our guest today is Anne Murico, who's the co founding partner at Floodgate Fund. She's invested in some great companies, including ModCloth, Refinery29, and Lyft. Um, she's also a lecturer at Stanford School of Engineering, which is where I think we originally met. We met there. Um, so, Anne, thank you for joining us. Welcome for to Founderline. So, um, yeah, I was trying to think back. It was, it was MS, MS &E MS &E 273. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I was uh, I a mentor. A mentor, and you were one of the muckety mucks. Assist. Yeah, exactly. And that, <laughs> that was fun. I mean, that, that was a great, uh, a great situation. So, yeah. usually. Um, before we uh, take questions from the audience, um, we usually spend a few minutes just chatting, and you know, I ask you a couple of questions just to Perfect. get you get you warmed up. So, um, you know, what, what I what I found interesting is you're you're a Palo Alto born and bred, right? So, Native uh, here, yeah. grew up here, Pali High, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, and then went off to Yale and came back for your PhD at Stanford. Um, so you you've lived and breathed Silicon Valley for a long time um, yeah. in a way that many of us who are from other areas haven't, uh, and and now you know spending your time on Floodgate and Stanford. So yeah. maybe tell us what you're up to. What keeps you busy, uh, uh, other than when you're running around chasing your kids all My the time? My three kids. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I co-founded Floodgate in 2008. Uh, it was an interesting time. Financial crisis happening. Oh no. Um, you know, angel investing not really happening at that time, and so a great time for me to get started in the business. Uh, and six years later, that's sort of my focus now, and it's it's been my life. Um, back in 2008, I was still finishing up my PhD. Uh, in 2010, uh, I had, in 2009 rather, I had my second child. I finished up my PhD in that same year, I think six weeks after I gave birth. Uh, and so, so since then, things feel a lot more quiet and much more contained. You're such an overachiever. <laughs> yeah, you make the rest of us look uh, look lame in comparison. No, no way. But it's been so. So now I, you know, I get to focus on just working with companies, and and it's been nice because now I've seen some companies go from super early stage to now high growth. Like Lyft is a great example of that. Yeah. Yeah. We're still investing in our core thesis, which is we believe in companies before everyone else does, and we invest in them and work with them and spend time with those founders. Um, and it's it's just a sector of investing that I really love. Awesome. And then and then what about Stanford? So are you still doing? Stanford? Yeah. So okay. so last year I I taught actually two quarters out of the three, and uh, and so it was pretty busy. Uh, and then this year, I'm going to be doing more of an experimental class, uh, which is more of a pop-up class, oh. uh, where I want to be talking about hunting thunder lizards. So essentially trying to figure out uh, what companies look like that end up being these huge, legendary businesses, what they look like in the very early days, because um, that's when we see them, right? They, they always look a little bit crazier than they do <laughs> later on. And, and, uh, and trying to explain to the students that it doesn't, it's not so logical, right? A lot of this is just based on gut and where you think things might go. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Well, and, and you know, you guys started back in 2008 and, you know, the at that time, you sensed that something was changing, right? That that the the venture capital world was going through a transition um, and, and you've seen it all throughout your life. So So maybe talk about what it is that you saw at that time and then how it's evolved, which 
you know, the pace seems to be accelerating the last six years with, with everything that's going on now, but um, maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so my venture capital history actually goes back to 2001. So before my PhD, I worked at Charles River Ventures out okay. on the East Coast. And my second day of work there was 9-11. Oh, wow. And so I've seen this cycle before where it was not the heyday of venture capital, but rather really when things screeched to a halt. Um, and so my, my, my view of venture capital was very much colored by what I'd seen during those two years. So when I came back to get my PhD, part of my intention was not to set up myself for a career in venture capital, but rather to get started in a high-tech startup company, and I was going to be a founder. Um, and when I reached out to Mike Maples, my co-founding partner at Floodgate, my intention was actually to see deal flow so that I could get a sense of what mm. was going on in the real world. So, and he was just investing as an angel at that he point, was right? an angel No at fund that point. or anything? That's right. Well, he, he had a small $10 million fund okay. that he had, he had gotten. Um, and so, so I reached out to Mike. I had done a PhD in uh, computer security and math modeling. And I said, you know, I'm thinking of starting a company in the space. Uh, can I just come in and see some of your deal flow? And Mike was just extraordinarily generous. And you, know, you see this in Silicon Valley. People just kind of open up their doors. Yeah. And, and he did this for me. And a few months into this, I would just go in every Wednesday, and he would hold what he called unpartner meetings. And uh, we would sit around a table. Sometimes we didn't invite other angels in. And we'd talk about companies that he was looking at. And I would just sort of give him my honest feedback. And then uh, a few months into that, he calls me as I'm driving up to Tahoe, and he says, you know, I have this great idea. You should drop out of your PhD program. <laughs> I just raised this fund. It's not a venture-backed startup like you're looking for, but now we could call it a backed venture startup. Let's go. And, um, you know, and I think back to it now, Mike was crazy to give me that offer, right? I'm, I'm a... PhD candidate at Stanford with no track record for investing. Uh, he actually has a track record at this point. He's invested in Twitter. He's invested in a bunch of companies that are doing really well. Yeah. Um, and, and he probably had a bunch of people he could have worked with. And he picks this woman coming out of Stanford without a PhD, uh, still hasn't finished it, without a proven track record, and decides to, to take a bet on me. And... Um, and so it was in 2008, uh, May, that I, I started working with him. And back then, YC, you'd go to Y Combinator, and there's you know 20 or 30 people in the audience. Yeah. Um, it's in some some place in Mountain View, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And, and like uh, eight companies, not, yeah. not like 70 or yeah, 80. Yeah, and each one has like, I don't know, 15 minutes to present. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, it got shorter <laughs> uh, like, very quickly. So and, and so it was just a very different atmosphere, right? 2008 also is when all the banks are collapsing. And so my parents at the same time were saying, you're not, and let me get this straight, you're not finishing your PhD right now, you're slowing that down, you're starting a financial services business, and all we are hearing about is banks are collapsing. So how is this a smart idea? Uh, but at the same time, I'm seeing all these entrepreneurs who need capital, but in a different way than they did in the past. Yep. And I'd seen this at Stanford as well, when I started my PhD in 2003, commoditized hardware like blade servers were really sort of cutting edge. But by the time you know 2008 rolls around, you have actually cloud services coming into fruition, and you know AWS, and everything is starting to happen. And so the the expense of actually starting a company literally had collapsed. Yep. And so you could see the need for capital collapsing, and and so there. Are, just a line of entrepreneurs out the door asking for five hundred thousand dollars, and Mike is telling me the story of five hundred thousand is the new five million, and because it used to be five million dollars is what got you started. Absolutely. And um, at the same time, I was also teaching with Steve Blank, and uh, I remember Eric Reese was also starting to think about these ideas around lean startup, and they would come into our office and we'd riff on these ideas. And it became really clear that there was something happening where uh, you could actually give an entrepreneur not $5 million, but 500000 and they could prove a lot. And that it wasn't technical risk that was keeping these guys back, yeah. it was market risk. Yeah. And that insight 
really changed everything. And so I felt like when I was justifying this to my parents, to my friends, to my husband, why this felt like the right idea, even though not a lot of people were doing it, it was just there were a lot of different market forces at work. And I imagine it's sort of what entrepreneurs must feel when they're getting started in a business. You're seeing this opportunity. You feel like no one else sees it, and you have to go after it. Awesome. Well, that's it's great. I mean, you guys were there at the beginning. So um, we, we had um, Jeff Clavier on not too long ago. Yeah. And I mean, he told the story of like what it was like 2004 when that was going on, right? Yeah. Everyone thought he was crazy. So. Uh, so no, it's it's pretty amazing what's happening. The access to capital and just the the velocity that can be achieved very That's quickly right. with not not much money. Um, I, I still remember the days we you take in five million dollars and it goes to Sun and Oracle, right. like like most of it, right? Yeah. And maybe a million for salaries, right? That's right. And so uh, so luckily those days are gone. Yeah. Um, so so right now um, on a, a more serious topic. Uh, you know, there's quite a bit of discussion in the Valley around sexism in Silicon Valley and like what's going on. And uh, I mentioned to you, we had Heidi Roizen here last week and had a, you know, great discussion around it. Um, you've, you've been in both the academic as well as the working world, both, uh, you know, operating as a consultant as well as uh, as a venture capitalist now. So w what have you uh, experienced or, you know, seen and what do you think we as an industry can do about it? I think it's an important topic to uh, to get out there and keep talking about. Yeah, and you know, to be perfectly honest from a personal perspective, I've been very lucky that I haven't faced a lot of the issues that I hear women talking about. And I've been in very male-dominated environments. I think that the place where I got lucky is that I've always worked with incredible male mentors who actually wouldn't allow that to happen, right? And and I also made sure that I wasn't put in that kind of position as well. Yeah. Um, but I think that there's also two different kinds of sexism. People sort of, mis I think they mix and match. Okay. Uh, and I would say one is sort of this, there's a whole discussion around sort of sexual harassment yeah. that happens. Um, and I think that's very different though from the sexism that people talk about where women are not included in discussions. Um, or women are left out of professional situations, hmm. right? And I think those are two very separate issues, and uh, I don't want to mix those two together. Got it. Uh, I think that on the professional front, um, you know, one of the things that was a lucky break for me is that when I got started with Floodgate, we naturally had gender neutrality, right? And so because it's Mike and me, we aren't doing anything and we're both we were both married at the time it's just seems like we wouldn't do anything that would jeopardize those relationships um and so as a result of that we always had you know when we did events together it was with our spouses and with our kids and so everything was naturally um neutralized yeah, from that perspective yeah. and um, as we've grown the firm actually we've added more women to the organization. And what I found with that is that, in fact, uh, there's, this, there's been some studies done where they say there's this rule of two, right? And that is that if you have two women in a situation uh, where it's fairly male dominated, all of a sudden, that woman's voice, when, when one woman speaks up, it's not the female voice. It's just a person in that room hmm. because there's actually two of them. And um, in the same way that I, I found that, you know, when I was coding on projects, when I was an undergrad in a robotics uh, competition that I was taking part in, there were actually two of us, right? And so two women. two women in this group. And it made it so that we weren't female voices in a discussion, rather we were part of a team. Um, on the other hand, when you are the only woman, it is very isolating at times, yeah. right? And I think that's where both startup companies, professional organizations can make a real effort to think about, you know, okay, we're having this discussion or even this meeting or this meetup, and there's only, you know, one woman in the room. How do we make it so that there's at least two? Yeah. In no, any situation. Idea. That's good. And idea. I think that, that, 
automatically starts to neutralize things. Um, on the on the sexual harassment piece, yeah. and you know, I think that's a much heavier topic. Uh, you know, that was something that I saw from the sidelines when I was in Japan a lot, and I, I remember. Uh, colleagues of mine would actually tell me stories of things that, that were happening to them. And I remember at one point I called my mom and I said, this never is happening to me. You know, it, it's just very strange hmm. because in this professional environment, practically every woman my age was getting sexually harassed. And she said, she and actually one of my work colleagues said, well, they're scared of you. Right. And um, in what way? And I think, you know, and I, I actually tried to dig into that because I thought it was it was an interesting point. Um, I was very, and I, I, in a lot of situations, I can be perceived as just very serious. And so um, back then, especially when I was really young, I was in my 20s and I felt like I had something to prove. Um, you know, when, when there was a situation and, and everyone was going out and they were getting drunk, I just wouldn't do it, uh. right? Um, I would also take the perspective, and, and I can't say that this is fair, right? A lot of women will say, well, that's not fair because other guys don't have to think about it. Um, but it's sort of the reality, and I just didn't want to be in that situation. Uh, as I also got engaged and I became married, the other lens that I took to it was if in that situation my husband would have been at all uncomfortable, right? Then it's not okay. Yeah. Or if anyone just happened to stop by and see me in a situation and they thought, hmm, that's not cool either. Yeah. And that, that feeling actually got stronger as I became a mother as well, right? And so um, I make a real strong effort that there's never any sort of gray area for me. And I try to look at it through that lens and I think there's always been clarity for me. Um, but it's not fair because, you know, other guys can put themselves in that, that situation and potentially create closer relationships with other people. Yep. Um, but I'd rather just not have a gray area. And I think that's, that's hard. And sometimes um, what is a gray area and what's not is very unclear. And that's where it gets really, really tricky. Yep. Um, but for women, it's just a really hard and... Uh, you know, it, it's a hard line to draw, and, and I, I, I don't see any really great solutions, except you really have to be proactive in protecting yourself and then walking away when yeah. a situation arises. Which is, which is not easy. I mean, even for a man, I, I remember distinctly two situations at South by Southwest where I said, look, we are executives in a company, and this is not cool and yeah. I am removing myself and, and getting out of here. You know, I don't want to get wasted with everybody else. Yeah. Like we, we, we have to be responsible. And I have, and by the way, I have a meeting at eight o'clock tomorrow morning, yeah. but uh, not, not the same as, as what many women go through. But um, I think you just kind of have to look at it. As you yeah. said earlier, like what happens if someone walks by and sees whatever it is, yeah. um, you know, and, and just try and, keep out of it so and my, uh, my partner actually had a I mean he's obviously his guy and he yep. he used to tell me when he first started uh, motive the CEO said that he had a no divorce rule right and so <laughs> um, so at these trade shows that when it you know dessert was done at the dinner there was no drinking and dancing afterwards they would all go back to their rooms wow that's good yeah, you know, Las Vegas is the downfall of many, uh, many a startup, uh, not not even established company executives. So not not a good place. Um, so all right, well, well, great, um, great topic that obviously needs more conversation. Um, why don't we dive in and see if we can help some of these people who have questions here? And one, once again, if you want to reach us, um, you can call us eight four 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 founder. You can email to help at founderline.com or you can tweet to at founderline. So um, uh, here, here's a tweet from uh, Hong Kwan. I don't know if you know Hong, but uh, uh, Anne, have you found any Thunder Lizard hardware startups yet? So 
I have a feeling I know what he's hinting at. I think he might have one, but uh, uh, explain Thunder Lizard for those who don't yeah. uh, know what that is. So uh, Thunder Lizard is actually something that my partner Mike made up a, a long time ago, actually. Uh, it's inspired by Godzilla. Yep. And so Godzilla is hatched from radioactive atomic eggs. He swims across the Pacific Ocean and appears in Tokyo Harbor with, a, with an attitude and then proceeds to, you know, eat trains and stomp on buildings and tear up trees yep. and and that that visualization was very uh, powerful to us in figuring out you know when we look at the top 15 companies in any given year uh, those companies appear to be thunder lizards in their in their various industries and so uh, it's just sort of a clarifying visualization of these amazing entrepreneurs that we get to work with. Got it. Um, and you, do you guys do hardware or mostly software? We've done mostly software, but we have had a, a few hardware deals. Uh, so one company of mine that I would put in that category is actually a neuroscience company. It's called Inscopix. Oh, never and, heard of it. Uh, yeah, it's pretty under the radar, but it was a Stanford PhD student who came to me and um, he had already pre-sold 35 of these devices. And what it is, is it's a microscope that is attached to a mouse's head. And it literally can read the mind of the mouse. And you attach it to a USB port, and you could visualize what's going on inside the brain of a mouse on your laptop. A USB mouse, it as it were. It is a live USB mouse. Wow, that's really crazy. Yeah. So, so sold this to be used for research purposes? Mostly to... research purposes today, but he's really transforming the kind of data that you can actually even acquire and understand about the way the brain operates, right? The, it's the equivalent to the genome sequencing uh, revolution that happened. Um, he's able to do that in the brain now. That's really um, cool. And so that that's one uh, company that even though it was a hardware company, uh, he was profitable last year and has still yet to touch the the cash that I gave him. Wow! So, all right, Hong. Well, now, now you got to make your pitch. So you got to you got to <laughs> get in touch with her, and uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll give out her Twitter handle in a little bit. Um, we uh, we have a call from uh, one of our regulars, uh, Larry from Yuba City. So let's uh, let's see if we can get Larry on the line. Larry, are you with us? I am. Hey, Joe. Hey, how are you? Great Welcome. Joe. So thanks for taking my call. Sure. Do you have a question for Ann? Um, so I do, um, and it's a, I'm going to start with an example. So, you know, every startup CEO wears many hats, and I do coding and testing as well as other, you know, administrative things. And in looking at an opportunity, I'm trying to figure out what are the most important parameters. So I want to give you an example. So I'm speaking at two national conferences in the fall that are in my time zone. I can travel to and back the same day, and both topics are closely related to our product. I've been invited to participate in a think tank discussion at an East Coast university on a topic that's more peripheral to a product. So on the cost side, I see time costs, dollar costs, and opportunity costs. Plus, I'll have to stay overnight. I'll have to endure the time zone changes there and back. But in return, I might expand my network with other national experts. I might possibly find partners or advisory board members. Um, and there might be an entree to funding. So I know there's no you know, formula for deciding whether or not to go. So my more general question is, what do you both see as the key parameters to be considered when deciding how to allocate the CEO's time among all the different obligations and opportunities? Wow, great question. That's a great question. Yeah. So the way I think about it is, you know, in any startup, there's really a couple of key questions that you're really trying to answer in any given moment. And if you have, you know, 10, 20, 30, you really need to narrow it down to one or two. And if you're making great progress on those two, then you can potentially start to expand it out. But if you have fundamental questions that you're answering, you should focus Please. all of your activities on those one or two things. Um, I really think that in general, um, startups have this problem that they're trying to hedge when they really should be focusing. And the single weapon that every startup has that most other organizations, especially the large companies and incumbents don't have, is really that ability to focus on the problem. 
And if you start to, to you know, hedge your bets and look at a lot of other problems that aren't core to your business at that moment, then you're losing one of the distinct advantages you have as a startup. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's always a tough question, right? Because you know, I used to look at my days and go, all right, what, what is gonna move the needle the most today? And, um, and where can I apply my time and energy? And it turns out that actually one of the best uses of your time is recruiting, right? Yep. Like probably, probably more than half of your time should be going toward leveraging you know your time so that you can get more people and that's right which is always hard when you're I don't know if Larry's funded or unfunded but um, you know sometimes you don't have the cash and so recruiting is a moot point because you're kind of at that earliest stage but um, but the focus point is dead on like you just gotta pick those things and and go do the things that are gonna help you the most yeah. so um, so that's great so Larry, Larry hope that hope that helps I think I think we lost you there on the connection but uh, um, worst case, it'll be on the video when, uh, when that gets posted. Um, so we have an email here from Michael. Um, it says, you only consider business plans through referrals that you trust. I don't know, is that on your website or something like that? Um, yeah. Why is that? How can somebody with a great product idea and great credentials get noticed? Yeah, so part of the problem actually is just the the fact that we ingest so much, right? So just to give people a sense of, um, this is probably true for most venture capitalists, uh, in any given week, we have about 150 inbound emails um, or phone calls of business plans coming through wow. our door. And Mike and I, between the two of us, have a capacity to meet with at most 20, probably closer to 10. And then we are each making an investment maybe once every quarter, probably closer to three a year. Okay. And so, so just the funnel dynamics are such that uh, it, it's it's very hard to get through. Yep. And one of the reasons that we say you know come through someone that that we know is that uh, some of these people are really scrappy in how they find a contact or a mentor or someone who can actually help make those introductions. Um, and it's just a way for us to, to have a second pass filter. Yep. Um, we have, though, found some companies that have just sort of come through either just when I was speaking someplace, someone met with me, um, and, and I just became really intrigued. I've had meetings like that in the past. Um, and also, our network is very, very large, right? And so I, I feel like it's not so limited when we say, try to find someone who knows us who can at least say, hey, I think this is a really interesting idea. Yeah, no, I think uh, it's a necessity, right? right? Like if you if you got to every response, you would be doing nothing else probably, yeah. and you wouldn't even be able to get to all those. Yeah. So, um, well, believe it or not, we're about halfway through, so wow. take a deep breath. Um, and uh, I'm gonna thank our sponsors for a moment here. So, um, you know, we do this show every week and we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors, Ustream and Auric. Um, first, I'd like to thank Brad Huntsable and the team over at Ustream. Uh, you know, since day one, they've been great to work with. In fact, we, we had some stuff we were talking about this week. Um, if you're thinking about doing uh, a meeting, you know, that you want to broadcast live or some sort of event or whatever it might be, and you need some streaming technology, um, definitely go check out Ustream and you can go to um, ustream.tv and you can uh, find out more. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Mitch Zookley and the team over at Auric. Uh, you know, Mitch uh, is the chairman and CEO there. I've known him for probably uh, 12, 14 years now. We work together on multiple companies, great guy. Um, I always tell people uh, when you're starting a company, one of your most valued advisors is your lawyer. And yes, they're important because of the legal advice they give you in employment contracts and financings and M&A and whatever else. But more importantly, um, they, they just have been through so many more startups than you'll ever go through unless you're also a lawyer uh, that they can offer you advice on just about everything that comes up and, and help you, say, you know, see, oh, well, the last 12 times we've done this, here's what we've done for the cap on the convertible note or whatever it might be. So um, get yourself a great lawyer. The team over at Auric is fantastic. Uh, you can find out more at auric.com. 
Um, I also um, want to thank our TV studio. So we uh, record this show every week out of uh, KMVT 15 in Mountain View. And uh, it's, it's a local nonprofit uh, community media center here in Mountain View uh, where you can uh, sign up and take classes and learn more about video and audio production. Um, they, they have great summer camps for kids with claymation and, and learning how to do TV shows. Um, and so we, we love the fact that we're here helping out and supporting this great community resource. And um, they're currently doing a fundraising campaign. Uh, it's called the Go Digital Campaign. And you can imagine as a nonprofit, they can't just go out and use their venture capital dollars and go buy all the latest equipment. So they rely on uh, the support of their sponsors as well as um, you know the revenue that comes in and donations. So. Um, if, if you're so inclined and you want to support the show, please uh, go to kmvt15.org and donate. Um, the money will go directly to uh, supporting the programs here as well as buying uh, the latest equipment so they can continue to upgrade. As, as technology evolves, you know, there's always a need for more uh, digital stuff as, as time goes on. So uh, that's kmvt15.org. So now, uh, now it's time for the Ask the Lawyer segment. So um, I mentioned um, Mitch Zookley from Oric, who, uh, who has been with us from day one on the show. And um, every week, we, uh, we try and go through a legal topic. And um, Mitch gives a little perspective. And then we, we have a little chat about it. So um, Mitch, uh, are you with us today? Yep. Good to talk with you, Joe. Hey, it sounds like you might even be in the United States this week. How are you doing? Thrill, thrilled to be right here in Silicon Valley. All right, great. Well, uh, today I thought a great topic would be um, uh, universities and entrepreneurship. You okay. know something about, uh, about both of those. So, um, you know, Mitch, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that comes up when companies are getting started um, uh, is, especially if they're in a university setting, is like, you know, what do I need to do? And Obviously, there have been some great companies. Yahoo and Google uh, have both come out of Stanford, lots of MIT uh, and, and other university startups. So, you know, if you're, if you're a student at a university and you have an idea for the next Thunder Lizard uh, that Anne is going to fund, um, you know, what, what sorts of things do these uh, student entrepreneurs need to think about as they're getting started uh, with their company? It is, but you can you can work with that university to license the tech. Um, but that's the first thing, and you know, particularly if you've worked in a lab and, and an idea comes to you while you're working in a lab with computer resources, there's a really good shot that that, that the university owns it. Um, so first thing, very very simple to deal with. Any lawyer can help you uh, work your way through that. And many universities have very um, well developed uh, licensing programs like those at Stanford that that can be helpful. The second thing to think about is whether the time is right and you've got the right skill set really to execute on the idea. In general, and this is, a, this is not a legal view, it's just a, you know, kind of a, a, a life perspective, the one thing I hear time and time again from, from founders I've worked with, particularly those who had a successful run at a company, is, gosh, if I, if I knew today what, uh, how hard it would have been, I'm not sure I would have started the company. And, um, but I'm glad I did. And, and I, I think that, that what, what that conclusion or that comment, which I hear time and time again, leads me to believe is that actually there's a huge advantage to starting a company when you're young, um, when you don't have all the answers, when it's novel, when you're hungry, when you're filled with youthful, youthful exuberance and passion, and when, frankly, you're, uh, you're not as jaded and maybe a little bit more ignorant about how hard something is going to do. Um, if, if you're about to tempt something that's got a 2% chance of success, uh, you're probably better inclined to do that earlier in your life than you are later in your life when you've got a mortgage and bills and you know kids to to worry about and stuff like that. So I, I'm a huge believer that um, uh, a, the best time there's no perfect time to start a startup, and uh, when you've got some passion around it, you should go. And uh, so we've seen an increasing number of, of startups get founded by kids that are in school. And I think that, uh, you know, look at companies like Looped and stuff like that. There's an awful lot of them that have been very successful with very young uh, founders. 
So aside from that special issue around making sure that the university doesn't own the IP, I think it's really just a question of getting, getting, uh, getting going. Um, hope that's helpful. Yeah, yeah, great. So, I mean, you've seen this from, from both sides. So what, what do you say, you know, you just mentioned that company with the Stanford PhD mm -hmm. student who came to you. So what, what do you tell these founders? What advice would you give them? Uh, so usually, you know, there's two different types of companies I see coming out of places, especially like Stanford. One is uh, the one where you have a PhD student who's working on technology that's been under development for 25 years with his advisor, and uh, it's it's basically weapons grade plutonium, right? <laughs> and and when you look at it, you know that there's it's extraordinarily defensible. It's, there's something really special there, and the question is, it's is there a problem that it solves, yeah. right? And so in that case, I spend a lot of time working with students to figure out if the market is big enough, right? And what is, what is the solution? And uh, what's the problem that they're gonna attack? Yeah. And, and that can take a long time to even figure out sure. and, and elicit. Um, the other half is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a cool problem, it's a cool product that they've been able to build up um, and and the, the question oftentimes there for, for students that I have is, again, it comes back to this, is this a big enough problem? Is uh, more often than not, I'm asking them, is this a, a good enough problem for you to be solving, hmm. right? Is this a good use of your time, yep. right? And yet another iPhone app, right, that doesn't really do anything for society. Is that is that really where you wanna spend your time where it doesn't have a ton of traction, but you believe that it's gonna get traction yeah. in the future. Yeah. Um, is that really the time to drop out of your university? Um, and so I have a lot of dialogues with students around, is this idea truly good enough for you? And those are two, sort of building upon um, some of the ideas that were brought up before, those are two things that I, I often spend a lot of time talking to students about. Awesome. Well, um, Mitch, that's that's very helpful. Uh, thanks, thanks for the advice, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you again next time. Thank you. Appreciate it, Joe. Appreciate it, Heidi. Have a good rest of the segment. All right, see ya. Heidi, Heidi. where did that come from? I don't Heidi, know. Where, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was in he's in a time warp he's uh, last week. Uh, poor Mitch. Mitch never sleeps, so we're, we're gonna we're gonna excuse him from that. Um, it, it was always amazing, like. Whenever I would get in touch with Mitch, he he'd be awake, and and uh, we we were, it turned out you know we did a show. Oh, he's in Rome, and it's three in the morning, and he's he's like live on the thing. Then he was in Hong Kong, and I'm just like, do you ever? He's like, no, I usually just go over there. I don't I don't go to bed. I'm just like, I don't know how you do it. But um, anyway, thank you, Mitch. Uh, great great to have you as always. Um, uh, let's get back to answering some questions again. It's uh, eight four four. For founder, uh, email is help at founderline.com and uh, Twitter is at founderline. So we have um, we have an email here from Steve. Uh, if the company that I'm working at does a bridge loan, what does it mean? Do they have to tell their employees when they do a bridge loan? When they receive a bridge loan, yeah. I see. Yeah, I guess. Um, no, you know, usually the the communication between the CEO and the employees around what happens in terms of financing is really up to the CEO. And I haven't seen a universal policy on what exactly happens. I would say most of the time, in fact, uh, financing is generally kept strictly amongst the executives. Hmm. And so it's not, it's not unusual for the employees not to know, and yet at the same time, I'm starting to see more of a trend towards transparency too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, we've seen more and more uh, CEOs communicating what's happening with financing uh, more openly with their employees. Yeah, makes sense. Well, and, and you know, I think I think what Steve might be getting at is a bridge loan can be a sign that something bad is happening, right? Like right. we haven't been able to raise the round or we're running out of money or whatever. Yeah, but so. I think there's lots of different reasons why that happens. Yeah. And so it's it's not just sort of a general negative signal. In fact, for some of our really, really great companies, we will actually come in 
and you know offer them a little bit more capital because we know that if they have that additional capital and they're on this acceleration curve they can get up higher up that curve yep. before they have to go out for a fundraise and that means that they're going to have you know higher valuation and lower dilution and it's sort of everybody wins scenario yep. so so it's not always negative and so i wouldn't take it as a universal negative signal great and Steve, I, I would encourage you, you know, if you're if you're concerned about it, um, talk to, you know, your executive team like, you know, they, they may not be able to answer the question like, are we getting bought by Google tomorrow? Yeah. You know, that kind of stuff. But but something like this, hopefully um, they set it up well and they have a conversation around. Well, here's why we decided to do this, because, right. you know, Anne came to us and thought this would help accelerate our growth or whatever it might be. So um, so good luck with that. Uh, we have another email here from Will. How does Floodgate make decisions on investments? Is it everyone agreeing uh, or just one person can do the investment? Oh, so this is a great question. Actually, one person can do the investment. And in fact, um, some of our, our best deals are the ones where, where you know one of us thought it was just totally crazy. Um, and what I like is because we have a two-person investment partnership. Um, we actually have a lot of disagreements and uh, we can actually communicate very openly with each other as to what we're disagreeing about and what we think are potential pitfalls for an investment. And, um, and so in a lot of cases, Mike will say, I just don't really understand it. And so it's sort of up to you to make the call, uh, particularly in my consumer investments where they've been more fashion oriented, um, that he'll just throw up his hands and say, I just, I don't, I'm not going to say anything here and I'm just going <laughs> to allow you to make the decision. I'll meet with the founder, but I'll try not to mess it up for uh, you. So you're saying Mike has no fashion sense. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. He says, he says he doesn't understand the business model, but you know what the, the process for us is fairly simple. One of us will uh, meet with a company and if we think it's really interesting, uh, we will then open it up to another meeting with with Mike with uh, the other partner yeah and once you've met with the two of us that's basically you've gone through the partnership meeting and uh, the two of us will circle up uh, and then figure out uh, of all the companies that we've looked at within that week which ones do we want to move forward with in terms of due diligence what will that actually look like what are the key risks that we think we're facing and then we'll just come back to the founders with here's our feedback here's our thoughts yeah i mean it's easy to be a little bit more nimble with two partners with two than partners. uh you don't you don't have the big uh, conference room with 20 chairs around it and uh <laughs> have, have them get up there and present to the partnership. We can never be very intimidating. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, all right, so this one is an email from Nicole. I'm having a disagreement with one of my investors over where to take our company, parentheses, strategy-wise. Any suggestions on how to best navigate this? And I think, you know, that's, that's such an important question, right? And it has a lot to do with the underlying dynamics between an investor and the founder. Yep. Um, Ultimately, the CEO is the CEO. The investor is there to provide capital. And if the CEO continues to do his or her job, which is essentially not run out of cash and continue to build a great team, uh, then the CEO has the power to make controversial decisions. Uh, the place where that can get hairy is if you're running out of cash and you're very much dependent on the investor. Um, that said, the functional relationship between the investor and the CEO is that the CEO really knows the details of the business and why they're taking a business in a certain direction or right, not. Right. And I fundamentally believe that our best founders are ones where we can have the open dialogue of, I'll say, this is the direction I think your business should go in. And the founder will very openly say to me, I think that's wrong. But here are the reasons why I think that's wrong. And those founders who have that internal compass and they know where due north is, that's incredibly important to the investor. Sure. Because I, as the investor, I'm coming in for a board meeting every four to six weeks. And I just know what I've been told or what I've managed to find out. But I don't know the whole picture. And I know that, right? And so... But you're, you're a good investor, right? There are, there are others who may not be, you know, quite as... Uh 
uh, not deferring, but you know what I mean, uh, um, reasonable in their approach. Like, well, you spend every hour, every day working on right. this. I come in every four to six weeks and I keep up the date. But, but you know, sometimes, I don't know if this is the case, but uh, sometimes these disagreements do occur, right? Right, so, and, I, and I think that the, the dialogue around why understanding what the motivations of the investor are, and this goes back to when you're receiving financing, you do have to understand, are they investing in your vision or are, are they investing in their vision of what you can become? <laughs> and and you really have to get to the bottom of that before you may, you receive that investment. Yep. And because if you're, if they're investing in their vision and you don't deliver upon that promise, you can have huge disagreements and it can be very, very dysfunctional. Yes. Um, but if you're at least aligned in the early days and you go through the journey together and you bring your investors up to speed on why you're making decisions the way that you are, um, you can maintain that kind of functional relationship. Great. Again, it's totally dependent on personalities. Yep. Yep. Well, I, I've, uh, I've worked with both Nicole and um, there are great investors and to use sort of geeky terms, I call them energy sources and energy sinks, right? And uh, energy right. sources are wind at your back, you know, giving you great advice, sometimes disagreeing with you, but, you know, always being positive about it. Right. Energy sinks are, you know, giving you assignments that, you know, may not be useful. Rock yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and so, um, you know, I, I would, if I were you, I would just be very um, candid with this investor, maybe bring some other investors in as well and have the dialogue. Uh, you know, it's hard to tell with this little information how many investors there are, all those sorts of things. But well, One uh, thing I would add to that, though, is there's, I think the, the benefit of being an outside investor and coming in occasionally is that there are moments in time where you as an investor will know sort of a fundamental truth about a business before the founder really sees it. Yeah. Right? And which is a hard moment, right? It's a very hard moment and it's it's the investor's job to be right about that fundamental truth. If you're wrong, it's a huge problem. Yeah, yeah. But also to have a functional enough relationship with a founder that you can have conversations about that controversial topic. Yep. Right? And and you want to have that kind of relationship with your investor. And as an investor, I want to have that with the founders as well. Sounds good. So hope that helps, Nicole. Good luck with that. Um, so we have an email here from Ruben. It says, you invested in Business Connect China, which is based in Shanghai. Whoops. Moved. Is, that, is that true? That's true. Oh. Yeah. So as a seed company, how do you provide great service to a company so far away? So I don't know if that's your investment or Mike's. Uh, it's Mike's investment. And actually, we have fairly regular board meetings with them. I, th I think that's a really good question. It's, it's actually the only investment we've made in China. Um, and so it, it's something that, that honestly, um, is probably one of the reasons we don't do very many foreign investments, right? In fact, um, there's only two that we've ever done. Um, we have to have a very high level of trust with the entrepreneur. Uh, but also be able to, you know, have emails dropped into us on any given moment and just, you know, here's the question, here's what I need to get answers on, and then be able to sort of provide that on the fly. So it's not us coming by your office and providing, right. you know, bespoke services, but rather we're sort of the, the ears on the ground here um, in Silicon Valley and, uh, you know, both of the companies that have that our investments outside of the U.S. have on the ground investors in their geographies. Okay. And was this a case where you knew the founders already or it was a... No, it was an area that we were really interested in. Oh, and wow. we got to know the founders and um, decided to make an investment. That's on. cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Ruben. Um, let's see. We've got an uh, email here from Wilson. How much reference checking do you do before making an investment? So we definitely ask for references, and that's one of the parts of our due diligence. We also do a background check. Um, oh, really? The, yeah. So, so what I would say is, um, for us, the major investment at the stage that we're investing in is the person, yeah. right? And so, 
Um, the background check is just, are they a criminal? And that's actually after we give them a term sheet. Um, we just sort of have to do that because if something were to come up, we wouldn't be able to look our LPs in the eyes. Um, but the most important piece is to find out from people who've worked with these people in the past, what are they like, you know, what, what strengths do they have? But more importantly, what I like to find out is where can I be of help? What are their blind spots? Yeah. And uh, so oftentimes it's, it's talking to people who've worked with these founders before to really understand what's the, what's the best way to provide feedback um, and to provide that sort of open line of communication. Great. So I have to ask, um, how many situations where you gave the term sheet and then you did the background check and you discovered there was something wrong? We've that... done nothing. Never. Everyone's always like clean as a yeah. whistle. That's that's great. <laughs> yeah, that's. Um, I I mean, I'd imagine I've been background checked without. Do do you tell them you're doing? Yeah, background yeah, no, because okay. we have to ask them for social security and whatnot. So oh, we always wow. tell them. We okay. always tell them. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I I I don't think anyone's ever asked me for my social security oh, really? number. So uh, yeah, good thing, right? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So we have another uh, email here from Amy. Who are some of the best investors you've ever worked with? Other than Mike, of course. No, I was going to say it's yeah. Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I know that's kind of putting you on the spot, but I figured we'd ask it anyway. Yeah. Who are some of the people? You know, so one of the guys that I, I worked with a long time ago at Charles River Ventures is Ted Dintersmith. Okay. And In um, Boston. In Boston. And he's just been an amazing person to, to observe in board meetings. Um, I've always found him to be honest and uh, he always has the right insight at the right moment and so I've always loved observing him. Uh, another person who's actually been a great mentor to me as an investor is uh, Kevin Compton hmm. who was at Kleiner Perkins a while ago is also at Radar Partners now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but because he's seen all these different cycles um, it's just always really great to get his advice on um, how I'm operating, how I could be better. Um, another person that I haven't worked with on any particular investment, but but is a lecturer, and I've I've seen him in MSNE 273 is Andy Ratcliffe, um, and I just admire him because uh, not only some of his frameworks around how to think about investments just feels really right to me. Uh, but also he was very courageous in becoming a CEO founder, right? And so yeah. um, taking Wealthfront through that pivot and uh, making a successful business, uh, there aren't many investors who've been able to do that. And so I really admire that as well. Yeah, really impressive. I, in fact, I remember seeing him in action at a MS&E 273, um, you know, like the final yeah. presentations. Yeah. And the questions were just like amazing. Like the really, and you don't have that much time, but yeah. Uh, no, he's he's a great guy, and yeah. uh, obviously one of the rare VCs who's crossed back over and, and yeah, uh, done a impressive. startup, and then got the hell out right when when he <laughs> uh, when it handed it handed it over, so uh, he uh, he can can relax a little bit more. So I know he's still very actively involved in Wealthfront, right? That's right. Yeah, so right. great guys. Um, all right, so let's see. Uh, this one is from Ted. What is the number one reason startups fail? And how do you avoid that issue? <laughs> I think it's uh, the number one is they run out of cash, right? Uh, yeah. People say, oh, it's not product market fit. It's all these other things. Well, it's you ran out of cash. Um, and I, I think that, you know, that one of the symptoms of the problem is the market wasn't big enough or the, the product didn't meet that market yeah. or the timing was off. Yeah. So how do you how do you avoid running out of cash? You raise cash. <laughs> <laughs> you convince investors to provide you with cash. Yeah. Um, you're also capital efficient, right? And I think uh, this is something that, especially in an economy where cash feels very flush. Yes. Uh, like right now. Like right now, I think that uh, operating in a way that your business model fundamentally makes sense for the long term is really important. So free is not a business model, right? And some people think it is, but it's not. Yeah. Uh, you can't just blindly acquire customers at any cost to fund your growth. Um, I just think that 
you have to you have to keep your eye on whether or not you're building a truly legendary company that will be able to last for 30, 50, 75 years. And if you if you look at your business through that lens and you don't see yourself being able to do that with this current business model, you need to fix it. Yep. Great question, Ted. Good luck. Uh, hope hope that helps. Um, I think I think we have time for one more here, and um, we're going to go to Tamir, who asks, "Do we need a board of directors at the seed round? What are the pros and cons?" So I don't I don't know. I, I believe you guys. Do you always take a seat on the board, or uh, sometimes not all the time? I I take the board seat most of the time, and the reason that I end up doing that is I've, I've been asked to do that um, because I'll, I'll spend more time with those companies if I, if I have a regular sort of every four to six weeks we're going to get together and hear the things that we're going to review. Yep. Um, and, and I only have certain number of slots that I can really take on for board seats and so those companies naturally get more of my attention. Um, and so do seed companies need a board? I would say that they don't necessarily need a board, but they need someone who's a lead investor, right? Yeah. And what that means is that there's someone who's in charge of that round as an investor, who when things aren't going well, will lead the charge and trying to help raise additional financing or help you figure things out. Uh, you just want someone who's minding the shop. Yeah. And so I think that the board uh, meeting actually looks very different at the seed stage. It's not three hours long. We're not doing audit committee. We're not doing compensation reviews. It's really focused around what are the core one to two questions that we need to be asking about the business and how do you make forward progress on those two, two questions. Um, and then, and then just helping out, right? So rolling up your sleeves and trying to find additional people for them, or uh, you know, when they're asking for ideas around partnerships, being able to come come through with concrete ideas. Uh, so I think of it as more of a real partnership at that stage. Great. Well, uh, we are out of time. Thank you Thank for you. joining us. You were awesome. Uh, you can find Ann on Twitter. Uh, is this Annie Maniac? Is that how you pronounce that? Animaniac. Animaniac. All right. So like a, a cartoon show. A n n i m a n i a c. So um, you can find her on Twitter there. Send her some tweets, Hong, if you want to ask her about Thunder <laughs> Lizards. Um, we are off next week, but uh, two weeks from now will be our next show, and our guest will be. Uh, Manu Kumar from Canine Ventures. Um, Manu's a great guy, and he's been both on the entrepreneur side as well as um, an investor in a bunch of interesting companies: uh, Twilio, Lytro, uh, Zimride, which is now Lyft. Which so is now Lyft. Um, we did that together. Great. So, uh, so it'll be another uh, fantastic show. That's um, Thursday, the 11th of September, also known as 9/11, at uh, five o'clock Pacific time. Um, thank you once again to our amazing sponsors, Auric and Ustream. Um, don't forget to follow us on Twitter. The handle is at Founderline. Um, you can send us questions for Manu at uh, help at founderline.com. We'll get those in advance and be ready for that. And um, you can also go to our website, founderline.com, and you can find out uh, the upcoming guests. You can watch videos from the previous shows. Uh, and you can also uh, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Uh, thanks for watching. Here's to the crazy ones, and we'll see you again in two weeks.